This is RT International bringing you your global news update this hour. Welcome to the program. The U.S. Senate Intelligence Committee met on Wednesday to talk about the threats posed by misinformation campaigns run by foreign states. And one issue of particular concern seemed to be the supposed invasion of social media by Russian means. Russia's foreign minister reacted by dismissing the discussions as absurd. <laughs> it's just hilarious when I hear that funny pictures can undermine American democracy. I think that's just paranoia that goes off the scale. It's not respectable for American lawmakers to make a sensation out of nothing. We are not the ones who invented social media and we are not the ones who insisted on making social media open to everybody. So, those who are sitting there in D.C. talking Russian meddling over and over are certain that the Russians are carrying on with their attempts to undermine U.S. democracy. And they're saying now they have a new target, the midterm elections in America in 2018. And we're also hearing that Moscow is not only using the traditional ways through Facebook or Twitter, but also all kinds of other platforms, the likes of Reddit or Pinterest, where they post more and more Russian-made memes. As cyber attacks remain a, remain a core part of Moscow's arsenal. Content is created, tested, and hosted on platforms such as YouTube, Reddit, and Pinterest. It's pushed to Twitter and Facebook with their standing audiences in the hundreds of millions, and it's targeted at the most receptive. This is a problem of the entire information ecosystem. This is cross-platform. Reddit confirmed hundreds of IRA created accounts. Tumblr did it. A lot of uh, pride, pride-related content. Less news, more memes. This isn't just a couple of platforms. This is music apps. This is video games. This is meme sharing. It, it, it's much broader than Twitter and Google. More conclusions from the experts. They are saying that Russia is inspiring controversy across the U.S. on various issues like immigration, gun control, Democrats versus Republicans, to cut the long story short, every issue that the Americans have divisions about. What's really lacking at these hearings, though, is, as usual, I should say, solid evidence that there is a system, that it is controlled and backed by the Russian government, and that the scale of it is large enough to really take this meme meddling menace seriously. You can now get help learning how to navigate through online fake news from an unlikely source. NATO has launched a Facebook game to teach people how to sort fact from fiction. Anastasia Trickna tried her hand at it. Welcome to NATO's new online weapon against misinformation. It's the News Hero. I promised myself to report only the truth. Join me on my quest to filter the news. Some of the headlines about the game might imply that its developers have a bone to pick with Russia. But on closer inspection, it seems it doesn't have that much Russian fake news to decipher. You might have thought that NATO's Latvia-based Strategic Communications Center of Excellence could dig up something better, especially given the lengths it went to last year trying to prove that Russian TV comedy was really an undercover propaganda machine. And of course, there's NATO's deep-seated suspicion of all things Russian. We don't accept uh, uh, cyber uh, uh, propaganda. We will not uh, counter Russian propaganda with more propaganda. We have to be able to counter disinformation uh, with facts. But in NATO's new virtual reality world, passions seem slightly more subdued. You enter a rather suspiciously empty and slow-paced newsroom, where you are the news editor in charge of deciding which reports are real and which are not by clicking on a folder with news stories in it, accompanied by repetitive elevator music. It's not yet clear how successful the game is in fighting fake news since it's yet to collect enough likes to be considered a viral success. And so far it's had mixed reviews, getting an A for effort from some users but dismissed as a propaganda tool by others. All you need to enjoy the game is a Facebook account and sign off your Facebook info to the Alliance in the process. Anastasia Cherkina, RT, London. Twitter has also found itself at the center of the debate over censorship. The latest controversy comes after it suspended Austin Peterson, a Republican candidate in the U.S. state of Missouri's Senate race, for what it described as abusive behavior. 
Peterson received a 12-hour ban after he responded to an accusation linking campaign funding with alleged Russian hacking. Peterson posted this gif of former Soviet leader Joseph Stalin as a reply to his critics. Some users flagged the post as offensive, and it was subsequently deemed to have violated the platform's rules, even though the image actually came from Twitter's own collection and appears first on its database when you type Stalin. But Twitter is holding firm that it was, its ban was not a mistake. It claims Peterson's reply amounted to targeted harassment and could be seen as an attempt to silence voices on the platform. But Austin Peterson believes using the Stalin image was not the main reason he was suspended. Three different emails were sent to me uh, about this, saying that I had not done anything wrong. Mysteriously, two days later, the ban was issued. It, it almost seems as if something had gone on behind the scenes and that this, this was an attempt to suppress my speech during a critical election. And it is quite ironic because my response was a, uh, was a picture of Joseph Stalin, which was meant to be humorous, saying off to Gulag. And then, of course, they mass reported me as if I have access to a Gulag here in the state of Missouri that, I could, uh, that could be a credible threat. Peterson's ban came as Twitter assembled a special research group to combat prejudice and promote what it defines as collective health and openness. The new team is yet to get to work, but it's already been accused of a strong anti-Trump bias. Why Donald Trump when you can Trump Donald? Something tells me we'll suddenly start seeing more Republicans in Congress, testing the waters and pushing back against Trump. Trump's 2016 digital team and Cambridge Analytica helped the Russians figure out who to target in their fake news campaign on Facebook. The team will work on algorithms to root out incivility and intolerance on Twitter and assess the extent to which people engage with different viewpoints. But Austin Peterson again believes the platform is making a concerted effort to censor particular ideas and talking points. We don't have free speech in the United States in order to be able to discuss the weather. We have free speech in the United States so that we can discuss very controversial things. I don't mind if a social media network has a bias. I assume a bias. But what I prefer is transparency about that bias. Twitter suppresses conservative and libertarian voices from being able to get their message out because they have a bias and it's deeply disturbing and a threat to American democracy. Concerns are being raised over the use of iris scanning technology as a means of unlocking aid for refugees in Jordan. It's feared that should their biometric data get into the wrong hands, the refugees may find themselves the targets of foreign governments or intelligence agencies. The Redfish Group went to investigate. It's really Aurelian. Uh, instead of using a password, a secret, I'm using a body part. It feels extremely invasive. In 2013, the UN announced its partnership with British Jordanian Iris Biometrics company, IrisGuard. They began rolling out an iris recognition and payment system that meant refugees could withdraw money and shop with the blink of an eye. Refugees at Jordan's two biggest camps, Zafari and Azraq, have to biometrically register their irises in order to receive aid. The fundamental principle that we, we go by is informed consent. For Iris Guard, the deal meant access to millions of refugees, a huge market to try its technology. And while it gives the technology to the UN for free, Iris Guard make a cool 1% from every transaction made via its iPay system, which could explain why bankers Goldman Sachs recently invested an undisclosed sum in Iris Guard. You've got companies like Goldman Sachs making undisclosed deals with Iris Guard who are in charge of processing refugees' transactions. Iris Guard is co-founded by one of Jordan's wealthiest families, including ex-US ambassador Karim Kawar. On their advisory board, you've got none other than ex-national security advisor to George W. Bush, Francis Townsend, former head of MI6, Richard Dearlove, both of whom were advocates of the war in Iraq. What I think of about it is like they are guinea pigs. These refugees are guinea pigs. The fact that the board is run 
or is a collaboration with people from the U.S. team that took part in playing the war on Iraq is more than alarming, is, is, is despicable. I had a heated exchange about this with the CEO of Iris Guard. We're dealing with highly secure technologies. We will be idiots if we do not ask people who are professionals in their field. Aren't there professionals? I that don't care about the politics. The war in Iraq? You are asking me about a political question. Fran Townsend understands. So it's a political fact. We are not involved in any political statements. We are not making any statements. So you do you deny? To separate it, do you? They are separate because we are a non-political company. We are yes, we work in you high are tech. Non-political, I understand that. Yeah. But they are not non-political. Do you understand that? Yeah, but do you understand that they understand security, or do you do deny that? Basically, the creators of the software and hardware, Iris Guard, are the only ones who know how it works, and we just have to take their word for it. Identification is complete. The collection of iris scans and biometric data isn't new, but using refugees that have no real choice but to hand over their information in exchange for receiving aid on this scale is unprecedented. And as yet, there remain many unanswered questions. Is the tech safe? Is it secure? Who has access to it? And who really benefits? Could it be that what started as a forced experiment on refugees in Jordanian camps could soon be coming to an app or ATM near you. The UN Refugee Agency's senior field coordinator in Amman says that he is confident the refugees' data is secure and that the biometric system ensures aid goes to the intended recipients. He says only the UN has the second half of the encryption key that would be needed to view an individual's data. We asked the Iris Guard Advisory Board to comment on the findings of the Redfish report, but they didn't immediately get back to us, while Goldman Sachs told us it had nothing to add. A video said to be from inside the plane that crashed in Mexico on Tuesday has emerged online. It apparently shows the moment the aircraft hit the ground. We heard a noise like thunder, and then there appeared a light on the side, where the wings are. Everything was fine, and then I felt that it fell and started to hit. Then it stopped, and we all started to leave. I was going to die. And I was praying. I was praying to the nombre Jesus, at the nombre Jesus. So Jesus saved our lives. It's a miracle, fortunately. We have no news of any deceased people. The only one we think is in a serious condition is the pilot. In fact, the pilot suffered serious spinal injuries, but thankfully all 103 people on board survived. Mexican media say 18 people were taken to the hospital. Initial reports said the plane crashed moments after takeoff, but others say it never completely left the ground at all. Investigators say the flight recorders have been recovered in perfect condition, but are yet to be examined.